So, here's where I want to start. The Bible calls us to a shared responsibility for young people. The very end of that psalm that David wrote, just catch it again. He says, I'm going to miss out the bit of being old and gray, okay? Just to make you feel better. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. In other words, my work on this earth isn't done until I've passed on my faith to young people. And this is a task for all of us. Notice David doesn't say, to my children. He's not just thinking about his family. He's broadened it out. It can't go any bigger. To the next generation. If you are in the church, you have a responsibility towards young people. Basically, without you realizing it, we recruited you onto the children and youth team. So you better look at the end of the service. You're on the rotor. We all have a responsibility, not just church leaders, not youth, just youth leaders, not just parents, important though they are, but we all have a responsibility. And the New Testament continues that same theme. There's a moment in Matthew 18, and you'll, you'll know this story, the disciples are arguing, typically, over who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What a useful discussion to have. And they come to Jesus to try and solve their argument. And I don't really, do you know this story? And Jesus takes a young child with parent nearby and uh, places the child in the center of them, right in the middle. And he says, you have to become, here's how you become great in the kingdom of heaven. You have to become like little children. And then he drops this bombshell. He says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Just telling you that in case you're on door duty at church in the next few months. When a teenager walks through the door, you're welcoming Christ himself. Think about that the next time you're doing that. But there's something about that image, I think, that's more than just what happens there. There's some meaning there. Jesus puts a child right in the center among them. And in fact, he uses that same word just a few verses later when he says, whenever two or three of you to get are together, I will be among you, with you. It's exactly the same phrasing as he uses here. Young people at the center of of the church, at the center of all we are as the people of God. But the challenge, of course, is how on earth do we keep young people at the center? How do we put young people and children at the center of the life of the church? The first thing we need to do, I believe, is truly see young people. Truly see them. I was thinking about the story this week of the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6. I haven't made you read all of these or else the readings would have gone on forever. But in, you know the story, don't you? The feeding of the 5,000. The background is Jesus is with his disciples, who remember are young themselves. They're teaching this enormous crowd on the side of Lake Galilee, this enormous sea. It's a, it's a huge lake. And it's been going on all day. And eventually Jesus grabs the disciples, they get into a boat, and they get away. And for me, I don't know about you, as an introvert, I would have been ready for some downtime after that crowd all day, all the teaching, all the noise, all the screaming and everything else. And so they disappear to the other side of the lake by boat. The problem is the crowd want more. You know this story, don't you? So whilst the disciples and Jesus are going across on the boat... The crowd basically are legging it round the outside at top speed. And so when they get to the other side, the same wretched people they just left are there waiting for them, slightly out of breath. 
And it says this. Here's the little bit. Here's the reason I'm telling you this story. It just says this. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And what I want to suggest to you is that there's a lot going on in the word saw. When Jesus saw the large crowd, this to me doesn't just mean literally that he saw them with his eyes. He really saw them because it says he has compassion. They're like sheep without a shepherd. It's as though he looks beyond the people to see who they really are on the inside. He really sees them. Here's the starting point for our journey to put young people at the center of the church, to truly see young people. Young people are used to being watched, but they're not often seen. And I wonder whether you see young people today, not just the many young people who are carefree and happy, but do you see also the young people who are struggling deeply with anxiety? Biggest mental health problem facing young people today. In fact, we're in a moment of facing the biggest mental health crisis in young people, full stop, that we've ever had right now. Do you see young people do you see those who are isolated and lonely? More young people struggle with loneliness than the elderly. Even in a social media world, isolation and feeling lonely is a very common feeling as a young person. Do you see them? Those dealing with pressures and responsibilities at home, things that you maybe can't literally see, but do you see what's going on? Do you really see young people today? Every time you listen to a young person, every time you read about young people or watch a documentary, every time you pay attention to young people, you are seeing them for who they really are. I remember back at the beginning, since we're talking history, the very beginning of Youthscape, I was asked to go to South Luton High School, which doesn't even exist anymore, to meet a lad who was known as the toughest, worst behaved lad in the school. He was in year 10, the worst year. And his name was Matthew. And uh, he, he, he was in and out of school on being suspended. He, all the teachers were fed up with him. Some were terrified of him. And they asked me if I could go in and help. I knew literally nothing. I wasn't qualified as a youth worker. But I went into the school. I didn't know what I was going to do. I met him every week in this little tiny cupboard office from one of the heads of year. And I did the only thing I knew how to do. I listened. And so week by week, Matthew told me about himself. And he told me about his life, the good, the bad, and the really bad. He told me about his dad, who was utterly useless and had left home and wasn't involved in his life told me about his alcoholic mum, his brother in prison, and I listened. I had nothing to offer him, but I listened. And it started something in his life. And I think, I think as I look back now, what became a, a, a friendship and a, and a piece of work that lasted over many years, I think I learned something there, which is that it was the first time for him, I think, that he had felt truly seen. Someone was listening to him. So this is the starting point for us. We need to see young people. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Here's the second thing. No young person is written off. The invitation of Christ is to all. Rich, poor, black, Asian, white, stray, straight, gay, transgender. Jesus calls all people to himself. All young people to himself. And Jesus is especially concerned with those at the margins. If you become a Christian, the good news is you get to hang out <coughs> excuse me, at the margins. 
You're in the company of the poor, the powerless, the voiceless. You get to stand with those whose dignity has been denied. You get to stand with the easily despised, the readily left out, the demonized, and the disposable. And the world will accuse you of wasting your time at the margins. But no young person is beyond God's love. In Mark 5, I'm taking you on a Bible study today, just a chapter before, a father comes to Jesus for help because his daughter is dying. You know this story? He's desperate. I can't even begin to imagine that desperation. But Jesus agrees to go, but then he is delayed by some days. And whilst he's still on his way, the news comes to this father that the daughter has died. And the people around the father say something really interesting. The first thing they say to the father is, look, why bother the teacher anymore? Your daughter's dead. In other words, there's no point in going any further. There's no hope anymore. Your daughter is beyond help. I've lost count of the number of young people where a, a, an adult, a parent, even a teacher has said to me, you're wasting your time with that one. I actually remember standing in a car park of a school and being told by a head of year, I'm afraid, that you're wasting your time trying to help that one. That will ne they're beyond the pale. You can't rescue that one. But no young person is beyond the love and the redemption of God. And you know the end to that story, don't you? Jesus goes with Jairus, the father. He ignores those who would say there's no point. He goes in, the dead body of the girl is there. He touches the body. The girl is brought back to life. No one is beyond hope. And just in case, you know, you think that's something I'm not capable of making a mistake about, I many, many times I've been tempted to think young people are beyond hope. Sometimes you, get, you find yourself saying, this may be a phrase you're familiar with, they're quite hard work, which just means, it's t I remember one lad in a school in Luton called Michael, and he was really hard work. He had ADHD, he was just generally annoying and noisy, full of energy, never sat down, broke every rule, upset everyone else in the group. He was a nightmare. And I was tempted to imagine there was a part of me that might have been happy if he wasn't there at whatever group we were trying to run and he hadn't shown up. But God's love is never beyond those young people. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Not some of the next generation, all of them. So we start at the margins. We see young people. We start at the margins. But we end with young people at the center of the church. Just to come back to that verse I started with in Matthew 18. Jesus puts this young person in the midst of the disciples. And he says, well, it's interesting, isn't it? What's happening in this dynamic? Who's teaching who at this point? It's the young person who has something to teach the adults. Be like a child. That's how you will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And that's perhaps the third and final thing, to be seen, to be on the margins, but loved and included. But ultimately, to hold young people in the life of the church means we will learn from them too. Young people have so much to tell us. Not only how you can use social media more effectively. They are very good at that. And if you do want a TikTok account, start by asking a teenager how on earth that works. But young people have so much more to teach us in the church. They call out hypocrisy. They name the things that we, we've forgotten to see anymore. They challenge us. Last year, we did some work with a group of young people growing up in the church about climate justice. And we asked young people, How, how's the church doing on that? And guess what they said? 
Remember, this is perhaps the greatest issue facing humankind right now. And we asked young people, how's the church, as Christian young people, how's the church doing? And they said, badly. They said, here's what happens. The church puts a recycling bin in the kitchen, and basically they tick a box and think that the job's done. No one talks about it from the front. In fact, all of these kids said, we've never heard a sermon on climate justice. And what they were really implying was, we know the way things work in a church, which is, if it's not spoken from the front, then it's kind of an indication that it's not important. And they called it out. It was stinging, powerful criticism. We need to listen and learn from young people. They have so much to teach us. I took Michael away for the weekend, uh, sorry, overnight, as part of a school group um, once. This is this challenging young person. We went to Hemel Hempstead. Told you we lived the dream. There's a scout camp there. It was winter. We were the only group staying on this enormous site. We had a little wooden fire in this, in this small hut where we're about... Ten young people, and I and a member of staff and, and one other were staying. And on the first night, we went out very late for a midnight walk. No one took a phone. We had one torch between us. And I was there with Sarah, who was the head of year for that school. And we went on this long 45-minute walk in the, in the dark. And Michael was there causing trouble, and other young people were there. And suddenly, after 45 minutes, Sarah trips, falls, and seriously injures her ankle. She's lying on the floor, writhing in agony. She can't even get up. And we all gather around her, and we're like panicking. What are we going to do? And we look down. She, she can't move. She's in real pain. And so I think, okay, as youth worker, what do I need to do in this situation? So I say to the young people, right, I tell you what we're going to do. Remember, we've only got one torch, no phone. Great youth work. And uh, so I say, right, your safety is important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back. We'll take the torch. We'll go back to the hut, and I'll get you safe, and then I'll come back for Sarah. And Sarah's on the ground saying, please don't leave me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, we've got to go. I've got to get the young people safe. So I start walking down the track, and all the young people come with me, Except Michael. Michael stands in front of me. He's 14 years old. And he looks me in the face and he says, Chris, this is wrong. I'm like, what? <laughs> this is wrong. We are not leaving Sarah here on our own. This is wrong. And I was like, wow. Here's the most troubled young person that everyone else has written off. He's the only one with the moral courage to make a stand and stand up against me. All right, wow, you are amazing. I then had to tell him the whole thing was a ruse. Sarah leapt to her feet. She was perfectly fine. We'd done the whole thing in order to see what would happen at that very point. Michael said a few choice words at me, which I won't repeat now. And we went back and we had the most powerful, amazing conversation about what it means to stand up for what's right in the world. The one who was written off was the only one of those young people who had the capacity and the fiber to make a stand. There's a fearless courage, a deep hope in young people that we need to listen to. Young people are fundamental to the church, not simply because we don't want to run out of, pe of people. They're not there just to make us feel better or increase the numbers. But we are compelled and stirred by God's love for them, that we might find them included as people of God. Do not forsake me, O oh my God, till I declare your power to the next generation your mighty acts to all who are to come.